This is Jordan Poyer, safety for the Buffalo Bills, and you are now listening to Cover One Buffalo Podcast. Let's go. Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your normal partners in crime, Greg Thompson and Aaron Quinn. Aaron, the season has officially come to the close. How are you feeling? Frustrated. Uh, it was a hell of a game. It wasn't the kind of, uh, there's a lot that we're going to have to kind of take apart and compartmentalize our emotions with this game, but frustrated, but, uh, excited that we're going to kick off the off season here coming up soon, uh, because this team is a team that is on the rise. They're an ascending team. And this was a great learning experience. No matter how you slice it. So I'm trying to kind of have a little bit of optimism in that. Going into this game, I didn't expect to win. They dragged my emotions into thinking that it would happen. I'm frustrated that it didn't. Uh, but now I'm back to where I thought we were going to be doing the show anyway. So here we are, and I'm going to try to have a little bit of a positive attitude, even though it's a frustrating evening. No, I, I think that's the right approach. I'm not quite there yet. I'm still in the the emotions of what that just put me through. And, you know, we'll spend some time going through, you know, the many different areas that I think are to blame yeah. for what happened here. But uh, first want to uh, say a big thank you to our presenting sponsor this season, uncle jumbos. Uh, they've been a great partner for us and really supportive. So excited about uh, being able to move forward into the uh, off season and uh, potentially, uh, you know, extending that partnership with them. But anyone else listening, if you're interested in reaching out to us about being a presenting sponsor in the future, by all means, reach out to us and let us know, but it's been an awesome season with uncle jumbos and joining all of their lovely things here. We'll get to the Uncle Jumbo's responsible play of the game in a while here, but uh, they were a great partner here and, and a great local uh, company that I hope everybody listening goes out and supports. Um, into the game, it was, you know, very literally a tale of two halves. The Bills uh, go out, you know, 13 nothing at halftime, 16 nothing overall. Uh, Everyone in Bill's Mafia is feeling good. Um, there were some things now in hindsight you can look back, and Coach McDermott talked about the idea of, you know, you need touchdowns, not field goals, and we end up getting five scoring drives, but those five scoring drives were one touchdown and four field goals. But in the moment, let's talk about those early uh, parts yeah. of the game. Uh, there was plenty to feel good about. I thought there was a lot of creativity. Yeah, and I get the whole argument. Like, you always want the more points, right, in the moment. But I – the lack of the touchdowns were what the problem with this offense has been all year. And it's not a singular player. It's not Brian Dable. It's uh, overall execution. And there's always something, uh, but two, at least two, what I think uh, would have ended in touchdowns is John Brown, not having the, I don't know if it was awareness or just the ability to make that play to toe tap uh, and bring in a beautiful pass by Josh Allen. And ESPN had said uh, Allen didn't give him the pass in the right spot, but I mean, geez, there's not a ton of yeah. better spots so you can put that pass. And John Brown, if he's going to be the wide receiver one and kill that wide receiver one conversation, he's got to bring in those passes in that moment. And the one in the end zone to Duke Williams, I know he had a good game and he did some nice things, uh, but he dropped a few key balls uh, in this game. And that's kind of been the problem when he is in is some of the consistency issues. So it, it's been an execution issue. Everybody had fall in this. I tweeted out during the game when they were winning that, this is one of those games when I look at my sheet when we're doing gruntled disgruntled for the end of the game and I'm marking good plays and positive plays and all that. I haven't had as many players leave their fingerprints on this game in a positive way, but kind of everyone really also left the, their fingerprints on this game in a negative way, execution on both sides of the ball. But uh, that's really what's holding this team back from scoring 28, 30 points with any type of consistency is execution. And it happens in the red zone. It happens in other plays and it's just killing drives and you, you can't leave a team like the Texans. They're a good second half team, and they they showed it. You got to put up more points when you have the opportunities. No, absolutely. You know, and you start with that opening drive, six plays, seventy five yards. You know, you have that beautiful uh, called quarterback sweep to Josh for forty two yards. Was called, yeah, um, just a beautiful scripted setup, and then you run the freaking double reverse pass from John Brown back to Josh Allen for a touchdown and to open up with one, we had only had an opening uh, play scoring drive once all season for a touchdown. And we are the lowest scoring offense in the NFL in 
the first quarter uh, to have an opening touchdown on the road, getting the ball first, you know, it was about as good of a start as you could have We then turn around and you get uh, a punt back from Houston and you get the ball back. And and that's kind of that same scenario where all of a sudden you'd like to see some momentum get going and we have a chance to get something happening there. And you get the weird illegal use of hands call, for, for Cody Ford. And that puts us back behind the sticks. And then all of a sudden you get behind and all of a sudden we're back and punting it back to them. And and those are the kind of things where, you know, a good team needs to be able to kind of take a big shot at them and be able to go and, and get a drive going there. And that seemed to be a common theme today as well. Um, you know, I'm not a conspiracy guy. I don't think that the refs are out to get us, but it certainly seemed like an awful lot of the 50 50 calls, things that could go either way, consistently seem to go uh, Houston's way here. And, you know, we'll talk about it in a bit with, you know, what was the right overturn there, but, you know, kind of giving them the benefit of the doubt on that weird give up kick return ball flip after the half. Um, later on, you know, at the end of the game, we'll get to that peel back block that, that ended up taking us out of field goal range. Yeah. So some of those plays, uh, it seemed like there was an awful lot of them that, that didn't go and- our way. The holding on to flags, uh, I think, was probably my bigger issue than any of the calls besides that peel back. That peel back was a bad one. But the other calls, I didn't necessarily have problems with any of the calls. I think the refs called a pretty decent game uh, as far as what they did throw flags on. But it was the lack of throwing flags. I saw a ton of holding. Yeah, uh, Houston obviously. never held the whole game. Yeah, that didn't happen. I saw a lot of physical play uh, in the back, in the you know, by the defensive backs on their team. Uh, so I think it's going to be worse when we see the all 22. So that's frustrating. But at the end of the day, even all that considered the bills still lost this game. The players lost this game execution, lack of execution, lost this game. They could have overcome uh, lack of calls or a bad one, bad call. Like you kind of expect that in the NFL these days, that there's going to be a bad call that particular, the crackback block or whatever was a, a blindside block was a bad call in a bad moment. So that one's, I think, fair to talk about for a long time. Uh, but none of the other ones, I think, impacted the game more than the Bills players' lack of execution. Yeah, and, you know, it's something that it's, you know, you don't want to have it come into that play. You don't want to have weird spots. You know, the, there was the very generous spot for the DeAndre Hopkins first down and things like that. And, and again, I no one's out to get us. There's no conspiracy to screw the bills and to do that. It's just frustrating when there is what seems like an imbalance in the calls as the game is going. So uh, it was just another area to get frustrated. And I think that, you know, obviously every game that isn't a win, we see um, – calls for Brian Dable's head. And I think it's hysterical that if I pulled the fan base at halftime of the game or after we get our field goal and go up 16, nothing, there was an awful lot of people who were probably concerned about, you know, whether we were going to lose Brian Dable to a head coaching gig somewhere else in his interview tomorrow. And now all of a sudden, you know, a handful of plays later, now he's an idiot who has to go. And I I thought he did an okay job. I thought that he was really creative in some spots. I thought that, you know, as we have all season, we haven't been able to consistently cash in um, on turnovers. We do seem to uh, set up field goals on occasion. I think there's a, a, a realistic call for a little bit more aggression in some spots. And I think you touched on it. Some of that's needing more talent from a playmaker standpoint that'll make more of that realistic, maybe a little better protection um, and giving Josh more time. But, you know, I, I thought that Dable play had a decent play call play calling day and that some of the calls now for, for his head, I thought were way overboard. I think so. Uh, I think it's going to be a very frustrating conversation on Twitter uh, for the rest of the off season. I don't think he's going to go anywhere. I don't think he's going to get any of these head coaching jobs. I think he'll interview for a few more. Uh, I, I don't think he'll get them as part of that process. They bring in a lot of interviews for a few jobs. And when it's that first time around and you're first getting your interviews, really, are you part of the hiring process? This is kind of a, the NFL is an old boys club and there's a lot of traditions. And so I don't, I I don't think he's going to be in it this round and that's going to disappoint some fans. It's not going to disappoint me. I think the continuity is a very important thing, especially with the young quarterback. This is going to be a big off season and a big year for Josh Allen. Year three is going to be a ton more pressure to take that next step, to learn from these experiences like a game like today. So I think you got to keep Dable. Is he 
uh, one of the better offensive coordinators in the league? No, not yet. Uh, is he perfect? Nope, not yet. Is he horrible? Is he the worst offensive coordinator we've ever seen? No, he's not. Okay. He's not the majority of the problem. Uh, he's not free from some blame and finger pointing. I think there's plenty of that to do. They're going to do that to themselves in the off season. If you think it's fun to sit with coach McDermott and go through all the mistakes in the off season, I have bad news for you. It's not going to be fun. Uh, And and so they're going to try to learn from this, but I I think they come back. People got to remember they were very frustrated with where our offense ranked in a lot of areas. They ranked at the bottom of all those areas last year, they got a lot of new players, put in a lot of new parts. They didn't really start to gel until halfway through the season. They jumped almost 10 spots in most of those ratings. It doesn't seem like a lot because we want more success quicker, but that's a pretty big jump. I mean, you work in business, you see how charts and things rise and how things trend. That's a good trending in the right direction. If they could jump another five spots next year, uh, have an improvement of, uh, half of what they had this past year that at, now you become a competent NFL offense and can, can hang with any team. So I know it's easy to point your finger at Brian Dable and say he should be fired, but I think he called a fine game in this game. And it, it, I wouldn't even fire him over this one. If he called a horrible game, I'm not going to fire him over that performance than just one game. So I think he called the fine game. There's definitely problems. I think there's the, the Frank Gore thing is probably frustrating for a lot of people Him continuing to lean on Frank Gore. I don't know that there's a better option out there. You can't give Devin Singletary every single carry. He's a young guy. I think they know what his workload is, and those are conversations they have. Um, He gave Frank Gore some balls in some bad spots. I'll give him that. There's some bad play calls, but you're going to have that, man. There's bad play calls on the defensive side of the ball. Texans had bad play calls. That's going to happen throughout a game. So uh, I I hope Dable isn't – uh, on Twitter or too light skinned here, <laughs> uh, too thin skinned here, uh, this coming off season. Cause it's not going to be fun, uh, for Brian Dable and his family on Twitter. Yeah. Well, and I mean, being realistic, you're talking about, we just put up a game with 425 total yards, 24 yeah. first downs, b- greater than 50, 50 and third down conversions. You know, those are not, Hey, we need to blow it up and start from scratch kind of offensive numbers. Um, You know, our red zone efficiency was awesome at the beginning of the year and then really struggled towards the end of the year. That's definitely uh, something we need to improve on. They, they were able to move the ball from 20 to 20. They struggled getting in there further. So having 24 first downs, having that many successful drives and only two of them even got into the red zone and then only one cashed in for a touchdown, that opening drive, um, you know, that's a, a struggling point. I think part of that is having a second year quarterback and, I think that's the next topic for us here is, you know, today was, you said it perfectly in the the pregame show as we're getting ready, this was the Josh Allen experience. We had amazing runs, nine carries for 92 yards, several of them in some really critical spots to pick those up. Some awesome throws. He hit a handful that were just phenomenal. He caught a freaking touchdown. He also took some unbelievably mind bending sacks. Mm -hmm. He had a couple of throws that he was begging them to intercept. He had probably four interceptable passes and luckily none of them did get picked off, but he had several of them that we were really lucky. They didn't get picked off. Yeah. The pick Um, six almost too. Oh yeah. You know, and a handful of the plays where he was trying to take aggressive shots down the field. Some of them are good, but you know, one of them was throwing to Patrick DeMarco double covered down the field. That's not a good risk. That's not a, that's not a high leverage risk play there. There are times where it's okay to throw, Hey, you're going to throw a 50, 50 ball to Duke Williams in the end zone on a guy that he has four inches on. That's a good risk. That's a, a healthy risk that, you know, is worthwhile taking Patrick DeMarco double covered by two DBs is not a healthy risk. So this is certainly a game that, I think fans should, on one hand, feel encouraged that I think Josh Allen can be the answer to what we need in the future. But I also think it's a painful reminder that he's not yet what we need in our future. And he's not yet a franchise quarterback. He needs to learn from this. And today needs to be painful for him. He needs to let this one sit and burn down in his belly and let him know that he wasn't good enough today and he had a chance pretty single-handedly he had some chances to solidify and win this game and that he came up short in some of those spots. And it's totally fair that we wouldn't even been in that spot. If not for him, he's the reason that we had a lot of that 16, nothing lead, 
but he needs to let this one burn in his belly and hurt a little bit uh, to learn from it going forward. And that, you know, you, you were spot on that this was the Josh Allen experience. Totally. Um, and that's okay. This is his first playoff game. I expected some of that actually earlier on and he played pretty well in the, the first half. I thought he played almost uh, perfect football throughout the first half. I, he did a great job. The ball security stuff's a uh, major issue, and that's part of the Josh Allen experience because you want him to use his legs. His legs are clearly a weapon that are, uh, it makes it very difficult for a defense. He could have had a lot more yards if Dawson Knox lays a block uh, yeah. on that, that other quarterback sweep. That thing was going to break for another 15, 20 yards. Uh, so he could have had easily over a hundred yard day. Yeah. Probably but, 120. Yeah. That threat becomes a little bit offset by his lack of ball security when he's running the ball and putting the ball on the ground. That's not okay. Uh, there's some things that Josh Allen did today that are not okay. Like you said, some of these interceptable balls that one to McKenzie should have never been thrown. McKenzie had no leverage on that route. He wasn't going to break open. That was a horrible ball. He also put some balls on the money that guys didn't help him out. And this is where I come back to execution. This has been a problem all year long. Uh, we, they brought Duke Williams in. We were told to be the guy that catches the contested stuff. He caught a handful of those. What he end up on the day for five four catches? Well, four two, two games now. Last game was six of 12. Today was four of 10. He's, yeah. he's maybe a little bit better than we, we had said, and I'm open to that. He's not yeah. the answer to anything that matters. He made some great catches. Some of the better catches we've seen from Bill's wide receivers today as far as being covered and be, and making a physical catch. Uh, he also didn't make the catches that we were, we were told we needed, and he was the answer to the problem that we needed, which was the 50-50 red zone uh, touchdown balls. And that's a problem because you let Josh Allen down in that situation. He throws a perfect ball to Duke Williams in the end zone, ends up not a touchdown. You settle for three there. That comes back to bite you. John Brown, supposed to be our wide receiver one, doesn't toe tap. That doesn't help Josh Allen. He could have had easily over that 300-yard day with two more touchdowns, either running or passing. We don't get it because of lack of execution. I'm not taking the blame from Josh Allen, but overall, this offense has a, a major execution problem. And it's somebody almost on every play, not executing whenever you see something going wrong. So it's a problem. Some of those sacks were bad. He was doing some of the turning your back that we hated all last oh. year. He reverted back to some of that. Yeah, he avoided it some so much this ones. year. So many times he avoided it. Uh, but guys were getting loose quicker than I had seen most of the year. And I think when we watch it back, we're going to see some of Cody, Cody Ford getting pretty beat up at spots. J.J. Watt, as annoying as it was the ESPN broadcast of them just all over him for the entirety of the game, he had a bigger impact yeah. on this game than I thought he would, than I anticipated he would. And that was a big impact on, jo on Josh Allen's performance. He really got in Josh Allen's head. Josh Allen was feeling pressure all game. He didn't feel comfortable after that first half. And they really dialed it up. So kudos to them. You know, hats off to them. They dialed up some pressures. Their defense played better than I anticipated. Like, you know, a few of those picks got dropped. If, if they get their hands on two of those, this looks like a great day for the Texans defense. And then teams are really scared of, of what they could do if they go on a run in the playoffs that their defense could turn the ball over three, four times in a game uh, against this Bills team that hasn't given the ball up. So kudos to them. But yeah, Josh, total Josh Allen experience. We're going to have more games like that. I think that's going to be the ride of Josh Allen, but he's a QB you can win with ultimately. Yeah, I think you you were right on the next area I wanted to focus on was the offensive line and that uh you know our guy Dave in the in the Slack channel was calling me out for uh how much I downplayed JJ Watt coming yeah. into this game and that um I thought he was going to play but I thought he was going to be a decoy. I thought he was going to be out there for some high leverage plays and kind of the Willis Reed idea of hey look guys I'm out here giving it my all you guys better give it your all. He was an impact on this game much yeah. more than I wanted him to be or expected him to be, and uh, it exposed what is still a need. We, we made a huge improvement and went from arguably the worst offensive line in the entire league to an okay offensive line. And we made seven major acquisitions. We had some injury issues. I think some of the depth um, could have helped throughout the year from a competition standpoint. And now we need to look going into this year, Quentin Spain's contracts up later in Waddle's contracts up. Um, we have an out in Ty and Secchi's contract. If we wanted, we have a, a, 
Z- freebie out in Spencer Long's contract. Um, so there's some options they're going to have that, hey, if you want to make a bigger upgrade, bigger investment in some areas, um, we're going to need to do that. They need to make a pretty serious decision on Cody Ford. Is he a long-term right tackle? We played him there all season. I think they need to decide that reasonably now to give him a chance. If you're going to look at redoing footwork and changing him and bringing him inside, I think they need to give him a heads up on that. And I, I hope they do. I have some serious concern if he can be ever an above average or elite level tackle with his footwork issues. And I think that his mauling style can really translate to guard, but we need to now make another step from an offensive line standpoint. We now went from being horrible to being okay. And we now need to go from okay to being good or above average if we're going to take that next step. And I think that takes another investment. So whether that's another top three round pick um, and, or, one or two more major free agent investments. We'll get into some of the names in the off season, but there's some names out there of guys you can go after and they'll decide whether that's bringing back Quentin Spain or trying to upgrade there, whether that's leaving Cody Ford at guard or bringing in an upgrade there or drafting another guy uh, to be able to work with a Ty and Secchi or someone else at tackle. So, I didn't think today was the best game uh, from an offensive line standpoint. I know we talked pre-show that Devin Singletary looked good, but he looked good because he was shaking a lot of guys who were making contact. So if the Titan or Titans, if the Texans were tackling better, there would have been a really bad Devin Singletary game. The fact that he shook, shook and juke so many guys was because the offensive line was letting him get hit so early. He was getting no yards before contact. He was creating everything by himself. Um, so I actually think the reason that everybody got so excited about Devin Singletary further exemplified how rough of a game for the offensive line it was. Yeah, I, I think the point that you made about going, you know, we've talked about it a lot from going from one of the worst units to an average unit, and there's going to be a need for even further upgrade at that unit here in this offseason. I think that that's true across all the phases of the offense. I think that upgrades are going to be needed, wide receiver upgrades are going to be needed in the backfield. You're not going to upgrade the quarterback position. You're, the upgrade is going to be hopefully Josh. It needs to progress. be his development, yeah. But yeah, his own development needs to upgrade. But I think overall we're anticipating upgrades uh, with actual players at the other positions, offensive line, running back, and wide receiver. And I, I do think that that's the answer, you know, to go back to the question we talked about about Brian Dable. I think I, I've seen enough progress in this unit being one of the worst at wide receiver at offensive line, uh, even running back with LaShawn McGoy's talent was there, but with everything else not working, it was one of the worst rushing attacks I've ever seen. The, the production that we saw this year, especially in the second half of the season, gives me uh, makes me feel really good about what they're going to be able to do with the type of asset flexibility that they have with the cap space, with the amount of draft picks. I think they're going to be able to bring at least guys in on every level to make an impact in 2020. And that should make everybody feel pretty good. Cause like I said, if you can crack into the top 15 offenses, if you can have a top 15 offensive line with the way this defense played this year, now you're talking, now you're winning games like Cleveland game. Now you're winning games like this Texans game. If you can just improve just a little bit, I mean, the bills are not far off. So yeah, to, but to come and bring it back to today, the offensive line just didn't do enough. They put Josh in some hard spots. If you're going to have a quarterback playing that type of game for the entirety of the game and be the guy to come back and make plays, you got to give him more. You got to protect him. It's been a few of these like big third downs where, uh, you know, it happened against the Patriots, big third down with the game on the line, you know, uh, Deion Dawkins falls on himself and they take a sack in this game. He had a big third down. Didn't even look like anyone blocked him. He's turned in his back and taken a huge sack, and it ends up taking the that that was the one with the intentional grounding. So the in clutch situations, this offensive line hasn't performed well for Josh, and they haven't given him any chance. Uh, you need better from them. You need to have some of those clutch situations. And I agree with you. I think it starts at right tackle. I think Deion Dawkins did enough this year. I think yeah. he progressed enough to uh, alleviate some of the concerns I had. Uh, after a sophomore slump, I think he's good. I don't want to throw him franchise tackle money, and we'll get more into that yeah. here this off season. But I think that that side is good at tackle, but I think you need to address right tackle. I don't know that they do. The The Bills have shown a little bit of stubbornness and sticking with some things that they think is right, and I think they keep Cody Ford where he is and hope that his development comes forward and, and maybe 
keep what they did with Inseki and Ford, but I, I hope they change that. But my gut feeling tells me I think they're a little bit too stubborn to make any massive changes over at right tackle and try to address some of the other stuff. Like you said, that Quentin Spain leaving, try to maybe upgrade there because uh, Quentin Spain's going to want some big money. So you're not going to be able to do it all. Yeah. They, you know, I know we said that last offseason, they're not going to be able to address all the offensive line pieces, and then they did. But I don't think you're going to be able to upgrade substantially across the offensive line. You're going to have to pick and choose where you want to put those assets and pick a spot and, and try to give yourself enough of an advantage upgrade wise there. Yeah. And, and, you know, as we kind of flip over, look at the other side of the field here, it's just infuriating to realize that we had a game that we shut out the Houston Texans until one minute left in the third quarter yeah, we had a game where we sacked Deshaun Watson seven times and hit him twelve more times. Mm-hmm. We had a game where you know we we caused uh, a turnover and were even in in the turnover battle, and just all that we had DeAndre Hopkins with zero yards and zero catches at halftime, and his first catch got stripped for a fumble. And just so many things that were going the way that, you know, we exactly would have scripted them to go and to still show. And, and, you know, obviously we're very Bill centric here, but Deshaun Watson is an incredibly impressive player. Um, The fact that we didn't get him down on some of those sacks realistically were the game, you you know, those times where he get obviously the big one at the end, uh, you know, would have been third and 14 at the bills 48. And instead he somehow gets out of a sandwich between Matt Milano and Saran Neal and dumps it off to Taiwan Jones. And everybody's now blitzed and is, is up there. So nobody's there to tackle him. Uh, And he runs for 34 yards. And that basically ends the game. That was only the latest of multiple crazy plays that he got himself out of and was able to do. And he started rough. He didn't have a good first half, but this bill's defense, I thought played exceptionally well for stretches. And then we've seen it a couple times now that, you know, whether that's the offense not capitalizing and putting them in a better position, having some late three and outs where we get them back on the field, uh, you know, and we did have a handful of those. We had the quick turnover then wrapped around at right after that with a, a quick three and out. Um, and we let them put up those scores real quick. Uh, and that's a, a situation where the offense didn't help. But this defense that we talk about being elite and being a, a top notch, incredible defense, it's tough that they gave up touchdown, field goal, touchdown, three straight drives with both times converting the two point conversion. And that a lot of it was missed tackles. A lot of it was things that we need to to tighten up on. And I don't know that we're going to see a huge talent difference next year. I think some of that is going to be development from, you know, guys like Tremaine Edmonds and Ed Oliver getting, you know, more into their role and, and more explosive. Uh, but there is probably still a need for uh, maybe a small talent infusion with a pass rusher or someone else on this defensive unit. So I don't want to be too hard on them. I think, you know, holding the Houston Texans to 19 points in regulation and 22 overall is, is good. I think that more of the blame is on the offense needing to score points and needing to convert touchdowns instead of field goals. Uh, but there certainly was some opportunity there that in this game, the defense had a chance to lock up a win and, and they weren't able to do that either. So uh, it was tough to see the way that it went. And, and I think that they were still a net positive overall, uh, but I think there were still some plays the defense would like to have back. There's really only been a handful of times I've been frustrated with this defense this year. One was Cleveland. I think that they the Bills offense didn't do a lot, but they did enough to take the lead, and, and the Bills let that up. Uh, and, and there was a stretch there with the rush defense where we had to talk about gap integrity for three weeks, and that kind of ticked me off having to have that conversation every single week. Uh, and, and then today I was frustrated with the defense. But I think you said it really well. I think they were the best part of the team today and i think they did a great job in that first half and but you don't blow a 16 point lead unless it's a team effort that that takes a team effort to blow say and 16 not the biggest lead out there but i had this conversation it it was a little bit of both of us in our emotions at the time but i had this conversation on twitter with our uh you know uh, kevin sari who does another podcast here on the cover one network and he had tweeted out that you know the Defense was to blame the number two rated defense and let a team come back like that. And I said, you don't lose a 16 point lead unless it's both 
sides of yeah. the ball. You know, you, you, you don't allow 19 unanswered points unless both sides of the ball are struggling. And so nobody did anybody favors, but yeah, the, the defense tackling again, struggled. And when this defense is, is having issues tackling, they're going to have issues. This stuff starts to get a little bit leaky. You're not going to keep Deshaun Watson from doing anything in a game. He's going to make three, four, five big plays, superstar plays, uh, get out of sack, stuff like that. He just, that's who he is. That's where he's at in his career. You're not going to keep Hopkins to zero catches on two targets uh, for an entire game. That's just not going to happen. They're going to get on the ball. I think the part where I'm most frustrated is what I thought the, the bills did really well this year that we didn't see year one as much was their ability to make adjustments throughout a game. Like a team would come down, score on the bills. They would kind of lock it down. They would get it back together. They, they didn't get flushed. They didn't get multiple drives after that. The, the Texans figured something out in the second half of this game and the bills did not ever adjust. I don't know. I'm sure they made adjustments, but they didn't appropriately adjust to what the Texans were doing. The Texans did it with balance. They, they didn't just come out, spread them out and and throw it and go for it on every fourth down. They methodically put an offense together and got a couple big plays, put some nice drives together and really put it to this bill's defense in the second half. And I think that came to a lack of adjustments or the wrong adjustments. And that's just not something we've seen with Sean McDermott and Leslie Frazier this year. So I think that maybe for me was the most frustrating part was never really fully being able to adjust to what the Texans were doing. And again, even on that last drive, they just felt like they got in a rhythm again and we couldn't get them out of a rhythm and keep them out of a rhythm. They always seem to be able to get their rhythm back on offense and just do enough to keep drives going. And it's just not what we've seen from the Bills defense. And I don't expect a lot of games like that in the future with this Bills defense. I mean, that's a lot of star talent talent on the other side of the ball. And that's what's going to happen in those big moments is sometimes talent wins out, uh, over what you know a good scheme or guys being in position it's just you know that's that's why they said deshaun watson had that michael jordan and when he came out he just makes big plays in big spots and that's hard to defend uh there's nothing really you can do to defend that but definitely frustrating on the defensive side of the ball but yeah man when you hold the team uh to such a low scoring game you really expect your offense to kind of step up and do your defense a favor in that moment they just haven't the offense really has never done that for this bill's defense yeah, and it goes both directions. You, you know, you talk about the in between of that run. So we get to that point in the third quarter. Um, DeAndre Hopkins gets his first catch. We cause the fumble. Uh, Trey White causes the fumble. Um, I was certainly talking about that on Twitter. Um, mm. And we get the ball at the Houston 32. We kind of fumble around and mess around, take a sack, get a penalty. We end up with an eight play, 18 yard drive uh, that we end up kicking for a field goal. So one. Right. That could have been a huge backbreaking touchdown there. You get the ball, they're 32 up 13. All of a sudden it's 20 to nothing. That's a much different psychological element than it is 16, nothing. Then we go back. They immediately answer with by far their most impressive drive, including a long uh, catch of DeAndre Hopkins over Trey white for 41 yards. That was a gorgeous catch. We get the ball back. That's when Josh fumbles. You know, he has a chance to run what looks like a first down. Whitney Merciless somehow weirdly hits the bottom of the ball and knocks it out of Josh's hand. But that was only four plays. We give the ball back at midfield. Uh, The defense holds reasonably, and we give up a field goal. Then we come right back with three plays and a punt, a quick three and out that was, you know, uh, a run play to Singletary, a quick dump off pass to Singletary, and then the catch that Duke Williams isn't able to come up with there. And all of a sudden we punt, we get a poor punt where Bajorquez doesn't flip the fields. We give the ball back to them and they come right back down with another touchdown. So that's one where, again, the defense needs to make a stop. You can't give up touchdown, fugal touchdown, but the offense certainly could have helped out a little bit there, keeping them off the field, being able to, you know, answer back on our side of things. And um, I know it came up in the, in the chat here, another area on defense, you're talking about, you know, that drive in overtime where they have third and 18 and you have a chance to get them off the field. Third and 18 is an automatic win. 
you have to be able to get the ball back there and to give up an 18 and a half yard, you know, play because we dropped every single guy 25, 30 yards back um, and they couldn't come up and wrap and tackle quick enough. That's just a play that you can't have. And that, you know, we have an elite defense. It doesn't change anything about that. I think that our 21 year old middle linebacker learned a lot from today as well. Um, But that's a play that we need to be better about to be able to, to get into there. So it's uh, that was a comment from Jason in the chat, you know, being able to bring that up. And it's, it's a key point in that it doesn't take away from how good this defense is, how talented they are, how excited I am about the future, but they own some of this as well. So it's a, it's a they tough do. one. The, the last piece I wanted to get to, as far as, you know, kind of griping about the game um, it's already come out, you know, that the, some of the NFL officials and, and Tony Corrente and some others have commented that the crackback block, <laughs> was not accurate um, that the bills ended up having. And we ended up needing to turn the ball over at that moment. You know, it's a third and nine play. We're at the Houston 42. So you talk about at that point, you're almost at exactly like a 60 yard field goal. Um, You know, Josh Allen scrambles, gets a handful of yards. We get down to the Houston 38. You're talking about a 55 yard field goal. That's not automatic, but indoors and the game that Hauschka was having, he had already hit four field goals. I'd say that's at worst a 50, 50 proposition. And you call an illegal cracks, uh blindside block that I know the NFL is trying to get better about. Yeah. Um, and that I understand for the safety of the game, you need to do that. But then they show the replay. The defender is looking they're face to face. He doesn't go helmet to helmet. He doesn't leave his feet. He doesn't take him off his feet at all or, or wipe him out. I was expecting to see some nasty blindside hit where they, you know, he destroyed the guy. He, he bodied him up. They both stayed upright. Wasn't helmet to helmet. Just in overtime of a playoff game, you absolutely cannot make that call. And I don't know if Hauschka would have made the kick. I don't know you know, it, how that would have worked out, but it, you put it back at third and 24 and you're in a no win situation. And, you know, we end up, they go with a, a heavy blitz and they try to do a quick dump off to Duke Williams that I think would have just put us in a slightly different position to punt. Um, but just that, that play was really the backbreaker from a referee standpoint. And just from not wanting to take the p- game out of the player's hands. I just don't think you can make a call like that. And that in hindsight, seeing it there, it was really frustrating to see the way that they approached it. It's the worst. You, like you said, you said it best taking the the game out of the player's hands. I think there's enough blame on the field execution wise on both sides of the ball for the bills that you can, we can talk about and get frustrated over, but you hate for a play like that to have such an impact on a game like this. And I really hate blaming the officials. I don't think it's the reason for the loss. It's It's just like any other one singular play is not the reason that this team lost, but it does add the weight to it. You think of the, what could have happened if that goes the other way. And and that's a fair feeling. And now that's something that we're going to have to sit with here all winter and spring is what happens if that play goes the other way. What happens if Sierra Neal makes the tackle, you know, there's going to be a lot of that, but you hate when the refs are involved, but it's an imperfect process. They're humans and they're imperfect. I, I agree with what you said earlier. I don't think there was some malicious attack on the bills and the league hates us and they don't want us to succeed and are, are calling bad calls and moments. I think they're trying to do something that's going to be almost impossible. The way these guys play, the league puts out stuff they're, They Like you said, they're trying to get rid of that crack back block. This wasn't it. It was a terrible time to call that play, I think, but it's part of the game. You're never going to get rid of that human element in the game. You just hate to see it go against you in that situation. Cause really no calls went against Houston in this game. It really just came down to the bills and we should maybe add that into a uh, toxic differential. I didn't get, do a good job keeping track of toxic, toxic differential in a game like this, but a play like that is a probably equal to a 20 yard pass. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? And as far as impact on the play. So that is part of toxic differential and the bills lost out on that. And maybe that was the straw that broke the camel's back 
in a game like this because it, it was so close, but uh, it definitely wasn't the only reason for the loss, but super frustrated and something that now we've got to sit on for a few months. Yeah. There was another one. I think I got like 10 screenshots of the ball of the clock at zero double zero on yes. the third and 18. Um, that, that one I actually did see live and was sitting there going, wait, why, why didn't they like that one was the full is the one second click. It, the, the way that the NFL explains it is that the clock hits zero the the referee looks at the clock, looks back up, and if by the time they look back up, the cl- the ball hasn't been snapped, then they throw the flag. So you have to. It's basically one beat after the double zero that you kind of get, and that one for sure felt like a full second beat after that. That it was you know zero or two one zero snap and there was long enough that it certainly seemed like they could catch that and identify it and uh that was another one that hurt this has been a problem in all of my nfl watching this year is the i haven't seen a lot of delay games called when i see zero on the screen how accurate is the broadcast clock to the game clock like it, it is it a direct pull from that i've never really known how that goes uh, but what this NFL should do, and somebody brought this up in my mentions, and I wish I could credit them right now, but I don't remember who exactly brought it up, is in stadium, when the clock hits zero, just set off an alarm. There should be some type of notification. <laughs> Honestly, you yeah. would eliminate this forever. Yeah. It should just, be an easy, quick buzz automatically. Yes. Just like in basketball, when the shot clock goes off in basketball, it buzzes, and that's it. The play's dead, and that's how it should be in the NFL because way too many of them are being missed with the current process, and that's something that you can easily uh, negate human error by just setting an alarm to the clock uh, that would kill the play dead, and you don't even have to worry about the officials there. So whoever brought that up, I'm going to find that tweet and retweet it because that's something that the, the NFL should utilize because there's no reason for that uh, in this day and age with the amount of technology we have. Make the game better through technology don't convolute it with technology and replays and things like that but if there's a way to just totally negate the uh, human element of not calling a, a penalty in a game and have fans upset that's a way to do it let's do it let's get rid of it but yeah super frustrating because you saw micah hyde in that play pointing to the clock trying to yell if they get the official's attention and then it gets snapped uh and i, I think that was the play it was a third and 18 and they freaking got 19 yards on a third and 18. So it's such a frustrating 17 years of being a bills fan play to see the delay a game pop up, see the bills pointing at it. And then the Texans come out and gain 19 yards on the third and 18 in a pivotal moment of the game. Uh, pretty much sums up my experience as a Bills fan here for the last 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wish I, I wish I could explain that differently, but that's accurate. Um, for moving on into our next phase, and we talked about it a little bit pre-show, but um, our Uncle Jumbo's responsible play of the game again. Uh, they've been a great partner for us all season, and that you know one of the ways that we've talked about them is they make some delightful products that you can enjoy and need to do so respectfully and responsibly, and that we want to pick out a play that's the uh, responsible play of the game within the the game itself. So one of the ones we talked about that ended up being kind of a runner up was Jaquan Johnson. Very heads up, they. Had had that weird play at the end of the first half and that that's another one that I actually agree with. I would have been livid if the bills got that call against us. And um, that I, I will say by the letter of the law, he never gave himself up. He didn't take a knee. He didn't stop moving. He caught the ball and casually walked forward and then flipped the ball. At no point did he do anything that designated giving the ball up. Now, I think it's reasonable to read into that, that he had no intention of doing it. He showed the call-off signal to his guys saying he wasn't going to return it. So I think it's the right thing to do that they overturn that. Um, but when he flipped it forward, Jaquan Johnson had a very heads up play, scooped the ball up, got the initial touchdown call before it was overturned. Um, and that I thought that that was a, a good one to discuss. Um, I actually love the idea of the opening drive and I've had discussions already in my mentions uh, about Brian Dable, but I think that he had awesome play calling aggressive on the road. I love the fact that they went with an aggressive shot play going for a double reverse wide receiver pass from John Brown back to Josh Allen for the touchdown. And that was my, you know, responsible play of the game, taking advantage of the situation, being aggressive, trying to get that score and take the crowd out of it on the road. And it worked in the moment. It didn't end up netting out what we needed at the end of the game, but it worked in the moment. And and I thought that was my, my call of the game. 
Yeah, I thought Brian Dable called it, called it great first half in general. But yeah, no, I liked the aggressiveness to come out. Uh, I was nervous about the Bills getting the ball first. That was one of my things. I was talking to Eric uh, kind of in private messages of being nervous about Josh Allen and hoping that the Texans would get the ball first and let our strength go up against them uh, with the defense and, and kind of settle into the game. But, you know, he came out and called the super aggressive game. I think that's a great point uh, and a great understanding the moment and understanding, Hey, if we get the ball first, we've got to come out and score in a game like this, because typically when you score first, those teams win, it didn't end up going that way for the bill state. But I mean, we talk about touchdowns and being able to come across points. They got them real quick. You know, they came out and put up the touchdown real quick. And you know what? Uh, that's all you can ask for is a great round of scripted plays. And this team hasn't been a team that comes out and starts hot. So it was great to see, um, and yeah, no, I think that's a fit, totally fair one. I went with, um, it didn't have the impact on the game that yours choice did because your choice led to points. Uh, well, mine led to points too, but your choice led to, uh, more aggressive points. Mine was in that waning seconds of the game, uh, in, in the fourth quarter, there was some confusion where with Cole Beasley in the challenge, did he get a first down? Did he not? Was the clock going to be running? There was a lot going on. There's refs on the field talking with Sean McDermott, talking with Bill O'Brien. They left the field goal unit out on the team. Corey Bork has, comes under center and, and takes the snap and, and uh, spikes it. I saw a lot of people on Twitter that were upset that he was out there. What are you doing? Giving Bork as the ball, stuff like that. I thought that was a fantastic said a coaching series by Sean McDermott and his staff to understand the situation, understand that they had those guys out on the field already, just in case, however, the call was ruled. There's a lot of things to sort out in that moment by the officials. The clock was going to start running immediately once they decided what was going to happen in that scenario. So Sean McDermott had them already got them out there, had Borkas take the, uh, snap spike it i didn't love the play calls that followed that i didn't think they did a good enough job to make the job better for Hauschka. even um i didn't the shots weren't great shots to the end zone but they ended up getting into the points to tie the game and that's ultimately all that matters but i thought that was a really nice series by the coaching staff at a very pivotal moment in that game and you know who knows if they connect on one of those long shots well series telling something if they connect on one of those long shots that changes the outcome of the game. And they only are able to connect on those because of the heads up situational football by Sean McDermott and his staff in that situation. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that's a great one. And I was shocked like, I I was confused at what they were doing when they were out there. And then I, cause I, I, my eyes went to Hauschka and I'm like, why is he by himself? Where is Bajorquez? And then I look, I'm like, Oh, he's under center. And just to think about the idea of being in that situation, of, you know, hey, we don't know how this is going to go. We don't want to mess up a bunch of time scrambling people on the call. Like you said, not wanting to be in the position of Josh not being sure if he's spiking the ball or taking a shot down the field. Um, that's a really smart play And that, you know, I, I am an enormous defender of Sean McDermott. I think that he is the single most valuable entity in this franchise and is a huge net positive and reason for where we are. He wasn't flawless today. I think there's things he's going to learn from um, and talked about it in the postgame show that, you know, should we have punted when it was fourth and 27 where Josh took that ugly sack? It ended up, we ended up getting the ball back and getting a shot there. But, you know, would we have been better off trying to punt and pin them deep and try to get it back? Um, Just different scenarios like that where I'm not sure that he can't find ways to improve. uh, But that's another area that shows just intelligent decision-making, putting the team in the right position, being able to help us make the best of that scenario. Uh, And that I'm confident that just like you said, how uncomfortable it is to be in those post-game video breakdowns, film sessions with McDermott. I know he's critical of himself as well and going to be looking to improve going into next year. So we didn't prep this beforehand, but um, any final uh, gruntled and disgruntled for this game uh, who was your disgruntled that you thought had the the majority of the blame? Uh, I'll go ahead and do both. Okay. For me, my gruntled disgruntled is Josh Allen. Yeah. Uh, he, it was the Josh Allen experience. So he gets both. He, he did enough plays to, to win this game for the team. He did enough plays to make it difficult for this team to win this game. And that's really what this game ultimately for me boils down to is the Josh Allen experience And that's not necessarily a negative thing. I think there's a lot baked into him being able to take 
away from this. I had a text message uh, going with a good friend of mine about Josh Allen's demeanor and how he's going to take this. And my friend didn't like the optics of it. He thought it looked like Josh Allen was sulking. He, he didn't like the look of it. And I said, I love every minute of this for a young quarterback. This is a big game that mattered to fans. Ultimately, yeah, did it matter to the players? Yes, they've put in a ton of work for this. But to the organization as a whole, it would have been nice to win that first playoff game since 1995. But where they're at, when we really look at the big picture, they're way ahead of schedule this year, making the playoffs with weeks to go. They have a young core team. They have a young quarterback that's learning. All that aside, this was a great opportunity for Josh Allen to suffer through uh, a heartbreaking playoff defeat where he had a role in his team losing. Uh, I think this is a good thing for him to sit and, and chew on and feel frustrated by and motivate him all off season long, because I've always thought this was about the 2020 season ever since Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean got here and they overachieved in my opinion this year, they're going to load up with talent. They're going to get more talent for Josh Allen. He's going to work on things that he wasn't good at this year and improve just like he did this past year, but he's going to have this just kind of stewing in his gut all year long. And, if there's one thing about Josh Allen that I like, and it's something that you and I have talked about, he's the anti Jamarcus Russell where he has all those talents. He has all those traits, but he also has that drive. He hears the negative about him. He sees the negative about him. He's honest with himself. So he's going to sit and stew on this performance uh, all year. So I don't think giving him the disgruntled is a bad thing, but he was definitely my mix of, of gruntled and disgruntled for this game. No, I think that's the right call. You know, I can't bring myself to put it on anyone on this defense when, again, you're talking about seven sacks and holding the Texans to 19 points in regulation. Um, (laughs) Jack brought it up in the chat that uh, Booger McFarland could be the disgruntled. Um, The announcers were terrible. I never mute the game, and luckily I get so tied up in kind of posting my thoughts and talking in the chat that I drown out a lot of it. Um, But they were horrible, and they were so obviously rooting for the Texans that it was infuriating. So I think that's a good one. Uh, that was a good call, but um, I think Josh Allen is right. And I think he's right on both sides. And I thought that, you know, the way you described it is perfect in that, you know, this is what we need for him to learn. This is what we need for him to have that fire in his belly, to realize that he made strides, but it's still not good enough. And he needs to do more. And that next season, I think we're going to add talent. I think it's going to be really exciting on paper and honestly, none of it matters unless he takes a serious step forward. And I think he can. I think he can do that, but he has to. He has to be more consistent. He has to work on the check downs, the swing passes, the, you know, the idea that one that, to Frank Gore, where was, he could have, you know, gotten a yard or two, gotten a little bit going, but he fired it on him immediately. Just being yeah. able to to work on tempering those things, the the arc of the ball to the touchdown to Dawson Knox in the end zone against uh, the Patriots, you know, any of those kind of plays, he has to work on the variance in his game. He has to work on his decision-making. He can't let those, you know, cover zero fourth down blitzes that we saw with the Patriots, that we saw with the Ravens, that we saw here with the Texans, and that he still has that little bit of panic in him when those critical moments come. And I think that he showed enough flashes of greatness in those moments to think that he can harness that and do more, but there's still more that he needs to improve and things that he has to do. So um, I think, I think you're spot on. I think that's exactly um, where we should go with this game. And honestly, it's the perfect synopsis of this season that the things that we saw should give everyone hope and optimism going into 2020, that there's a chance that we have a franchise quarterback and to have a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of concern in your belly that we're not sure if we have a franchise quarterback. We just don't know. And I do think that we're going to have a chance to find that out in 2020. You've said that for a year and a half now, that that's when we're really going to know. By the end of next season is when we're going to know if we have the answer here. Um, and I agree with that wholeheartedly, and I'm excited to find out. I'm excited to to talk about that. I think you and I have a lot of fun things to go through with the war chest of assets and um, things that Brandon Bean and his staff have to work with to be able to get this team ready for the the draft picks that we have, the signings that we have, the, you know, extensions that I think we're going to give out. There's a lot of exciting reasons to, to look forward and a disproportionate amount of that is simply on the back of Josh Allen and his development and next step forward. So uh, I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to them putting more around him 
And, you know, those are some of my kind of final thoughts as we wrap up this game here. What do you have for your, your kind of lasting moments? I think the excitement of the plethora, I always call it total in is asset flexibility. The amount of asset flexibility that Brandon Bean has this off season, I think buffered some of the emotions that I had right after this loss, because I said, you know what? For me, it's always been about 2020. They've set themselves up so well. This is going to be such a fun off season to cover for this team. I'm actually, it's hard being in the playoffs because now I'm like two weeks behind, three weeks behind on where I normally at in the draft process. Now I got to, you know, kick it into gear with the, the draft process here this year. So I'm super excited about this off season. This loss is going to hurt this week while we kind of break it down and see all the misplays that were out there. Uh, and really kind of pick that apart. But I'm very excited about the future of this team. I, the thing I think I'm the most excited about is you, you saw the Bills hype video where they pulled down on the playoff caliber signs and put up the championship caliber signs. I think that that's true. I think that this whole team is going to have that same reaction that Josh Allen, I said, is going to have, where they're going to fester on this moment that we saw today and know that they're so close to being a championship caliber team that they can go into the playoffs and beat anybody that they really didn't, you know, outside of that Philadelphia game this year, they didn't get beat by anybody real bad. They took some losses, but they didn't really get beat up at any point this year. They're a good football team. They're not far away from being a championship caliber team. And now that's the goal is to be a consistent playoff team, to go in and win some playoff games, to continue to take those steps in the right direction. And, I've never been more excited to get into the off season and to get into spring and see what Brandon Bean and his staff can pull together with what is it? $90 million and nine draft picks. Uh, They're going to add a substantial amount of impactful talent for 2020 in the next few months. And that is something to be very excited about that might right now, uh, feel like a distant thing, but it's coming right before we know it. And uh, it's a really fun time to be a bills fan. The team is on, an ascending uh, area. And I can't remember the last time where I felt like this team should continue to ascend versus, Oh, this is just going to continue to be a mediocre team for three years. And hopefully we can get in the playoffs at some point. I really see steps being taken to, to go forward. And that's super exciting for me. No, absolutely. And I think that, again, we'll get into it in great detail, but there's reason to be optimistic. It's okay for this one to sting. There's yeah. nothing that we're going to talk about that's going to all of a sudden make this better. It sucks. There's nothing great about what happened today. I think of the grand scheme of things, I don't know that this was some team that was going to go on a Super Bowl run and that we were, you know, we messed up some championship opportunity here, but you never know. The The NFL is a one and done tournament and crazy things happen. And we had a chance to win a game and move on next week and see who we could have played and, and just taking it one game at a time. And we lost that. So I hope that that stings for the team. I hope that that burns in their belly. I'm confident we have leadership in Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean. That's going to do that. And is going to make them remember what, what they gave up on here today. And I think you, you pointed out perfectly. I love that we raised the bar and that just being good enough and, and having a nice season isn't good enough anymore. They're now a good team. And they now need to expect to be good. And the expectation next year absolutely should be to make the playoffs again and to make a deeper run in the playoffs. And I'm excited and looking forward to that. So uh, as we wrap up here, if people want to uh, banter politely and and potentially uh, have a nice, casual, cordial time on, on the Internet and on the Twitter machine, where could they find you? Yeah, you can find me at Aaron Quinn 716, but I'll warn people right now. I think I'm going to lose a lot of followers in the next week of just because I I, I really think that I'm going to stay level headed and super optimistic about the future of this team. And I think that's going to piss a lot of people off. So if you're not ready to to look forward and be excited about a, a team on the rise, don't bother following me because you're just going to unfollow pretty quick. But if you want to get down with that type of train over the next few weeks, months, follow me at Aaron Quinn 716. I love it. Um, I will get there with you eventually. I probably have another day of bitterness and pettiness in me um, <laughs> before I'm ready to look forward. I, I know that that's there. So that that's in the back of my mind that the good things are coming. We have a brighter future ahead of us. And this was ahead of schedule of where we were. But if you want to come find me, I'm at Greg Thompson, G-R-E-G-T-O-M-P-S-E-T-T. Um, I probably got a little bit of bitter fire left in me uh, for another couple hours here. But ultimately, the, the, the arrows point of the right 
right direction. Um, awesome job in the chat tonight, guys. You are fantastic. Appreciate everything uh, that you are bringing here, especially after a game like this and the season wrapping up the way that it did. Um, you guys are fantastic. If you want to be a part of that, come find us at cover1.net. Join as a premium member. The Slack channel was fantastic today. Everybody back and forth all the time, just kind of rooting together and going over the game, uh, bringing awesome information to to each other. It's a contest, basically, to share the, the quickest and earliest information. Um, we have channels for draft prospects and mock drafts and free agent discussions and all kinds of other things going on. So come on over, check us out. Uh, got an awesome special running there to be able to join. So uh, that's a, a great opportunity. Also, give us a rating, give us a like, give us a review wherever you're at, however you're listening to us. Give us a subscribe or a follow. Um, it really means a lot. We do this uh, all for kind of the fun of our our hobby in the in the side gig world. Uh, and we need those kind of shares and likes and reviews and ratings to be able to help us keep going forward. So if you want to hear more of what we're doing here, help us that make it a reality. Um, Aaron, anything final for the people before we sign off? No, man, I think you said it. I just, a lot of people before the game today were tweeting uh, how much they appreciate the show and cover one and all the work we do. And honestly, man, that means the world to me. We don't do this for anything, but to have an outlet to talk about the bills. That's all we're doing. I, we're not trying to become members of the media or take over the world or anything like that. So knowing that people are out there listening, participating with it is the coolest thing in the world. It's super humbling. I appreciate every single one of you guys. I appreciate everybody in the Slack channel, uh, kind of just keeping everything fun. And I can't wait to spend this off season with you guys. So thanks to everybody out there that listens and deals with us here throughout the year and all of our bad takes on Twitter. I appreciate all you guys. And it's been a, a fun ride this year. And I, I look forward to the, the fun times we're going to have here this off season. Agree completely. Uh, can't thank you guys enough. It's been a great opportunity and great season. Looking forward to a great off season together. But you have been listening to the Cover One Buffalo podcast, and we are out. <laughs>